messed up What can figure it out That's how it chooses you I am Claire Patton uh, Yeah, that's Claire Patton And I'm Teresa Sparks This is our podcast, It Chooses You uh, We talk about things we like uh, Stories that interest us, etc um, It's not a great marketing category The marketing's not there yet We're not narrow enough for that But also it's boring to be that narrow So we'd rather entertain ourselves as well as entertain you I think is the, right. the thrust Yeah. Welcome to something vague is what we're saying <laughs> Yes, welcome to something vague is the perfect tagline. Perfect. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How you been? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, I saw that Liz Acosta on Friday uh, for tacos at our favorite taco place. And uh, she and I both had three fucking margaritas each. And it was so stupid because before I went to get the tacos, I was like, I don't want to drink. It doesn't appeal to me at all. I'm not interested. And then I got there and I was like, well, I have one. And then, of course, by the time I have one, two and three go down easy. So, yeah. Well, and it's really hard when you have particular activities such as drinking associated with A, a certain place and B, certain people. So you put those people in that place and it's a foregone conclusion. Yes. What we do at that place is we eat two too many tacos each and have two too many drinks each. (laughs) That's just what that place means. Um, Yeah, so I had that experience again, even though I knew going in, I wanted it to be different. No, but Liz very sweetly. Oh, my gosh. So she gave me like belated Christmas presents. And she's like, I know mine is still in process. I heard the episode about Murphy eating all of the gold. (laughs) (laughs) And she was like, I thought it was so sweet. I just wanted to sparkle. And I was like, yeah, he he was very adorable. She's like, so I know mine's not ready. And I was like, good, because that's what I was about to say. So for the second time this Christmas season, I have received beautiful presents from people I love and have not handed them anything <laughs> reciprocal in return. So this is clearly my lesson for this year. Like <laughs> there's something I need to work through around that, whether it's like receiving good or making sure that I'm reciprocating the positivity I'm receiving, whatever mm. it is, like there's something going on. She handed me a bag. Um, with a book, um, Mairead Case, who works at uh, Naropa, she's a poet and a writer, uh, her book came out. And so she gave me a copy of that. And she asked me to pass it on to you when I'm done. So you'll be oh, great. Um, reading it as well. And she also, after listening to whatever episode it was where I talked about how my mom didn't get me the corduroy, t- corduroy shirt I wanted, but got me a different color and how it ruined my life. I don't even remember what I said. Except that I'm, I think I said something like, I'm not a beige person, but she kept trying to dress me in beige, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Liz has lost a lot of weight in the last year and a half. (laughs) And she is clearing out her closet. She's like, I found this shirt and I thought you might like it. And she handed me a blue corduroy shirt. (laughs) Oh, that's so thoughtful. So thoughtful. She's like, I heard that episode and I thought you might like it. And I was like, I'm going to wear it when I write. This is going to be my writing shirt because it's like big, chunky, cozy corduroy. And the sleeves only come to like just below my elbows because Liz is a very small person and I'm very tall. (laughs) So yeah, it's fun. (laughs) I like how you've uncovered the secondary purpose of this podcast, which is to just inform those nearest and dearest to us of what would be the best gifts. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> oh, you don't know what to get me? No, I'm not going to make you a separate list. Just go listen to every episode of our podcast. <laughs> you'll you'll come up with something from there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. This is my this podcast is my gift registry. Oh man. What else has happened this week? Holy shit, Joe Biden was inaugurated this week. Woo! <sighs> Felt so good. I got a notification today that my screen time was down 21% last week. (laughs) And I was like, sure it was because I didn't have to protect the union by somehow by doom scrolling. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Doom scrolling is what I, that's my civic duty, right? It's just to go through and just shake my head and go, oh my God, what are people thinking? Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. And you know, disaster can come, but as long as I'm aware it's coming, somehow I feel safer. (laughs) You've you've done your job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I got that same notification. I was like, oh, that makes sense. (laughs) It also makes sense why I'm a little happier this week than I have been for quite a while. So, I mean, we have to just talk about the Bernie Sanders memes because they just, it, I mean, it's the best thing that's happened in a month or, I mean, maybe even the whole year, honestly. Yeah. Like some good things have happened, but many, many, many terrible, terrible things have happened. Not least of which, like, growing recognition that white people like us really have to get to grips with our shit. 
and yeah. stop being this way. And then to see Bernie in his parka and mittens sitting on the Iron Throne, it just made me so happy. <laughs> I saw an interview with him. Seth Meyers interviewed him and showed him all the memes. Yeah. But first he asked him, like, are you aware? And Bernie's like, I've seen him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he's like, I got enough 20-year-olds working for me at various levels. But yes, <laughs> I have seen those memes. Well, his um, I got a text this morning from his, I think it's his personal campaign. Because I subscribed to a bunch of things back when What's-His-Name was elected. Appointed by the Electoral College, I should say. Mm-hmm. And, uh... So I got a text from him and it was like, hey, if you donate, we'll, we're selling these sweatshirts with the Bernie meme on it if you want to buy. It. And I was like, I absolutely do want to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. So I have one of those coming soon. Just a black sweatshirt with an old man sitting in a, in a chair on it. it and how great. great was Amanda Gorman? Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to say. I mean, she's she's such a good writer. And such a good performance. That's what I was going to say. Of course, she's a wonderful writer. But what really struck me was her level of performance was mm-hmm. so right on. Yeah. I'm very jealous of her ability. Um, she's, yes. And this is not related, but my favorite thing about like all of the ladies who were there, I saw a meme that was them in their coats um, put next to each other like a rainbow flag. <laughs> That's Which great. was so like, you know, going from the, the purpley of Michelle Obama and then Amanda Gorman was in the middle in her yellow and then the blue was Jill Biden or whatever. Like it was really, yeah, it was super cute. <laughs> it was just also really nice to to watch the fashion and the meaning behind the <laughs> fashion choices and have that meaning not be white supremacy. Do you know what yes. I mean, I mean like, that's lack it. lack of caring about <laughs> what's happening right. in the world squash your empathy kill your neighbor yeah it's not that anymore that's not the messaging of the federal government anymore I, I said to tim at one point who's the fancy late fancy blonde lady in the white coat and he was like that's j-lo i was like oh <laughs> it took me a second because <laughs> they kept showing her from the side and i was like who is that <laughs> who's the fancy blonde lady i love that yeah i mean you know when fashion isn't like is this is this a coded fascist meme like is this you know, when you don't have to be concerned about that, it's um, really refreshing to just look at a coat and be like, that's a very nice coat. And I like that color. And that can just be the end of it. Yeah. So there's a lot of relief associated with this week for me, for sure. And mm-hmm. also like relief, but also we have so much to do. And and yeah. now we don't have the imminent threat of a fascist coup until the next election cycle, when I'm sure they will try this shit again, because that's who they are. Uh, but you know, so now we have the chance to really like, okay, the electoral college needs to go. Okay. Justice reform needs to happen right now. Like today, Mm -hmm. there's no reason for it to take any, like, let's go, you know? And I'm encouraged by the fact that nobody seems to just want to celebrate and, and have, you know, become complacent again. Everybody's aware that we're still in the shit Yeah, and there's a lot of work to be done. So yeah, the things I saw that I resonated with the most were like, just give me one day. Just let me celebrate for 24 hours. Just give me 24 fucking hours. And then I promise I will be right back fighting the good fight and doing what needs to be done. But today I just want to be fucking happy, okay? I just want to drink three margaritas and eat too too many tacos. That's right. And go to sleep and feel terrible the next day. <laughs> That's how I celebrate. What have you been doing? Same stuff. I have been a little bit in repair mode, as tends to happen in January. C episode on visible mending <laughs> mm-hmm. and Bondi rescue <laughs> uh, to varying degrees of success. And we've, we've redone our room, our, we call it turning the dark eye of Sauron to various areas of the house. So <laughs> it's not dark. It's good. It's organization. <laughs> we've been turning the dark eye of Sauron all over the house. So it's getting more and more organized. We've gotten rid of a lot of stuff, which has been great. So everything has a place. And when it, when some everything has a place, you're much more likely to put it in that place, right? That's right. Yeah. It has a home. This lives it there. It feels good. I've been eating a lot healthier this week. More vegetables, less carbs, less sugar. And I do think there's a direct correlation between what's happening in my house and the way I'm treating my body. Oh, for sure. And then also a direct correlation between what you put in your body and how you feel. Yep. There's that. <laughs> yep. Well, I, this week, um, I've wanted to talk about this for a little bit because I've known this story 
It's a relatively uh, recent thing that happened, but I watched a documentary on it. And as I was sort of thinking about what I'm in the mood for, I think I'm in the mood to just shit talk a corporation. So <laughs> that's Excellent. what that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, we I covered the Costa Concordia debacle and uh, tragedy uh, a few weeks ago. And I'm I'm going to address another Royal Royal Caribbean associated um, loss of human life mm. um, today. So it's kind of a bummer. Uh, I thought I might do something happy, but but no, I actually like I feel supported by the things that are happening in the government. Um, and so because I have that support, I'm like, well, now is the time to destroy corporations. <laughs> That's just my personal thing. Right. <laughs> and not all of them. Some of them might be OK. But, you know, in general, when it's um, the question is between human life and profit, they choose profit. That's what they're designed to do. Mm. Um, and I find that very morally questionable. So here we are. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about the Wakari slash White Island volcano disaster of 2019. Oh, I do not know this. Okay. So uh, my sources are Wikipedia. Duh. 60 Minutes Australia did a great 30 minute piece on it. Business Insider had a great article. There's an article called The True Story of the White Island Eruption uh, by Alex Perry for Outside Magazine. And then Charlotte Greenfield for Reuters um, did some did an article on uh, Maori practices that I used here, uh, and Bill Chapel commented for NPR. So all of those are are in here. Um, so it's Wakari is the Maori name of the island, and then White Island is what the colonizers call it. Um, and it seems like in the communities that are near this island, they they sort of go back and forth between calling it one or their one or the other. From the sources I've read, most of which are by white people, it seems to go back and forth. I don't know if that's actually how they view it or not, but um, I kind of use Wakari and White Island interchangeably because of that. The Wakari volcano erupted just after 2 p.m. on December 9th, 2019. 47 people were on the island at the time. Of these people, 38 were passengers on a shore excursion from the cruise ship Ovation of the Seas, which is a Royal Caribbean vessel. Noticing the eruption from the mainland shore, three commercial helicopter pilots conducted rescue missions to the island in their helicopters, bringing back 12 survivors. Wakari is, about, is an island that's about 40 miles off the coast of New Zealand's Bay of Plenty, um, and the island is about 150 miles southeast of Auckland, and Auckland is in the northeast part of New Zealand. Uh, it's a small island. It's only about 800 acres. Uh, and it's really just the cone of a submarine volcano. That's what the island is, is the top of a volcano. Oh, okay. So it's not, like, it's not like Hawaii, where there's an island and then there's a volcano on the island. This is a volcano that is the island. Right. I bet it's beautiful there. It looks like the moon. Mm -hmm. There are hot gases escaping from cracks. There's no vegetation. It was a sulfur mine until the 30s. And so it's very much an alien landscape. Like, it wow. does not support But life. people do live there? Nobody lives there. There, there used to be a sulfur mine there. There's an abandoned sulfur mine, um, and only it's privately owned right now by the trust of a family of a stockbroker who bought it in the 1930s and then refused to sell it to the government when the government was trying to consolidate all that stuff. And instead, they made it like a special a land trust essentially, and they are responsible for permitting the people who are allowed to come to the island. So it's privately owned. Tours lead people on this island. Uh, you the uh, dock at the island is basically so if you look at it like the the crater where where the magic happens right the actual <laughs> did you see taskmaster where that that scottish comedian ian was talking about the vol part of the volcano and the cano part of the cano of the <laughs> no. volcano okay so <laughs> ian sterling is his name and they they were tasked to build a volcano okay and he was talking about what he had chosen to do which failed and he's like i focused too much on the vol and i didn't pay enough attention to the cano or something <laughs> like that <laughs> so the vol part of this volcano um is a crater that's sort of a 20 minute walk from shore okay and you walk up a slope right you're essentially walking up where the magma would flow down totally. if it erupted. Like, right. that's how you get there. So tours lead people on a hike up to the crater and then a walk around the rim. The rim is only about two-thirds of a mile in diameter. So very small, very small island. And from the rim, you can look down into an acid lake that takes up part of the crater. Whoa, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, very intense, right? 
And so like New Zealand is big with adventure tourism and the whole thing of adventure tourism, which you and I have excoriated in podcasts in the past, is that you want to feel more alive by being a little closer to death, right? right? This is the argument that uh, Alex Perry makes in Outside Magazine. That's why adventure tourism is a thing, because you want to feel enlivened without actually being in danger. So tourists were drawn to this island and this tour um, because it's such a short walk from the dock to the crater. They knew that they would be looking into a semi-active volcano just a few minutes after arriving on the island. It doesn't actually require any effort on their part either because it doesn't look like it's much of a slope. And so instead of having to do this thing where you climb a volcano and have to climb the mountain and it takes several hours and all of that, you basically can just like drive up to it and park and get out of your get out of your car slash boat and just take a little walk and then you're there. Right? Yeah, I mean, this is the volcano tour I'd go on for sure. Exactly. As I was reading, I was like, oh, well, that's reasonable because <laughs> it's easy. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to laugh a lot about some of these things, but I just want to make it clear. I am not making fun of the people who chose to do this. Right. Um, like we make our choices and they thought they were making an informed choice. And some people were very hard on them. Like, well, what did you expect going to a volcano? And I was like, well, sure. What did you expect? But also you can do dangerous things in a safe way. And they were working with established systems and they assumed they were being informed about the realistic safety implications of what they were doing, right? Well, to be honest here, if it were me and there was an established tour there offered by a company, I would assume it was safe. Yeah. You know, I would rely on governmental regulation and the history of the company as being safe. So I, I would have had no problem going on something like this myself. That's right. I'm the kind of person who, like, I understand the need to do personal due diligence, but I don't ever do it. So I'm exactly like these people. I would have gone and not even thought twice about it. Okay, so we have firsthand accounts of the eruption from Stephanie Browett, who was on the tour with her father, Paul, and her sister, Crystal, and from John Kozad, who was there with his son, Chris. These two people, Stephanie Browett and John Kozad, were interviewed by Sarah Abo for 60 Minutes Australia. Um, cell phone footage released to 60 Minutes Australia shows that at least one tour guide, there were a couple tours on the island at the time, at least one tour guide knew that the volcano was active and that there was danger. Um, the footage shows gases escaping from cracks in the ground alongside the trail to the crater rim, and those, those plumes of gas are getting very high. Uh, and the guide says, yeah, the volcano risk level is at a level two right now, and level three is an eruption. So we're at a level two heading to a level three. And then he cuts the crater walk short because he starts to get concerned. Mm -hmm. um, seven minutes after the Browitz reach the mouth of the crater, the volcano erupts. Okay. As black smoke started pouring out of the crater, they took a selfie. And we wow. have that because their phone survived. So I'm not being shitty. I'm usually shitty. But again, I'm not being shitty in this case. Like they didn't realize they're not volcanologists. They don't know. And they'd only yeah. literally just been told there might be a danger. Right. So right after that happens, they hear the front tour guide yell, run. Oh, God. Oh, my yeah. God. Ah. Yeah. yeah. The ash plume from the eruption rose 12,000 feet into the air. And it was powerful enough to knock a 1.5 ton helicopter off its landing pad and completely fold its rotor blades. John Koza said he heard a sound like a giant tree splitting in half, like a giant crack. Mm hmm and then he and his, they heard the sound of rocks hitting the ground all around them. Visibility on the ground went to zero, and everything was hot. They could feel their skin burning, like white hot crystals were hitting their foreheads. He oh. says he remembers hearing himself reciting the Lord's Prayer. He's like, I, don't, I didn't think I was religious, but I sort of like realized I was saying it as this was happening. Stephanie Browett says the force of the blast just rolled her around on the ground bumping her into rocks and she was being burned the whole time. She, when she looked at her hand, she saw Ugh. nails hanging off and skin hanging loose. Oh my God. I think at that point I'd just be like, well, I'm dead. Like, I mean, yeah. do you know what I mean? I'm like this is yeah. it. So the tourists that survived the explosion stumbled down to the dock covered in so much ash that a honeymooning couple said they couldn't recognize each other. Um, the tourists expected to be met by rescuers but when they arrived, only the tour company's rubber dinghy was at the dock. Um, a tourist from another tour boat that was off the island at the time took a video of the survivors as they tried to climb into this dinghy, and it's mayhem. Like, people are stumbling, and 
nobody knows what's going on and they're all trying to get in the boat and as they were trying to climb in they were losing strips of skin from their hands because they're hanging onto the guide rail and it was just okay off. so how would does this normally work that the boat drops them off and sort of recedes into the open water yeah, so it's not a deep enough anchorage for a tour boat to actually get close. So it's not the cruise okay. ship that goes. The cruise ship is berthed in New Zealand. And then a smaller boat associated with the cruise ship takes them to White Island. And then an even smaller boat takes them onto the land. It's not deep enough for a normal sized boat that can carry all of those people to get close enough. So they go out in little rubber boats. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it sounds like a horrible system, but you know, yeah. <laughs> hindsight. Hindsight, yeah, always. The tour boat that this dinghy took the first group of survivors to took 90 minutes to get back to land. So Stephanie Browett and 19 other victims were left on the island because they were so hurt they couldn't get down to the dock. In the chaos leaving the crater, she had been separated from her dad and her sister. And just staying awake, she said, took so much energy, she, she thought she was definitely going to die. And then she heard her dad say her name. And she heard herself say yes. And then a few minutes passed and he said her name again. And again, she said yes. And she realized that he was keeping her conscious. He was wow. making sure she didn't fall unconscious. This breakdown is from Shane Cronin, who's a volcanologist at the University of Auckland. Uh, the reason the White Island Wakari volcano is unpredictable is that the magma under this crater, which is in part a lake, is very close to the surface. So the magma is really close to the surface. And so heat and gas from that magma can suddenly, and with little to no warning, release super hot water trapped in the pores of the rocks on the crater floor. And the trapped water turns to steam at supersonic speed and then explodes. Because this eruption is caused by steam and not magma, it makes it a lot harder to track with current volcanic monitoring systems. It, it's capable of generating great force, but it doesn't provide the warning triggers that magma-based explosions do to these instruments. Mm -hmm. um, the force is enough to shatter solid rock, excavate craters, and eject rock fragments and ash up to a distance of two miles. Jeez. Yeah. So Cronin says that uh, because the triggers for steam and magma eruptions are so poorly understood, even if we recognize a trigger, the warnings are likely seconds to minutes out instead of hours or days. So maybe not a great place to take people to tours on. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> so three, this is so, okay. So this has happened. There are survivors on the Island. Some of them are on a tour boat coming back to shore to a town called Wakatane, which is the, the home base for a lot of the tour companies that operate there. Three local helicopter pilots in Wakatane, which is a small town on shore. Their names are Jason Hill, Tom Story, and Mark Law. They weren't trained as first responders. But they see the plume of smoke coming from the island, and they immediately jump in their helicopters to see if they can help. Wow. When asked why they would do that, one of them says, when you're human, you try and save other humans' lives, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And his approach owes a lot to the Maori way of looking at community, uh, which is called tikanga. Um, the word apparently describes a good heart, a true soul, a deep spiritual instinct for doing what is right rooted in centuries of listening to the world and accepting your place in it. Mm. People who followed Takanga knew what to do and did it without thinking. So Hill, Law, and Story get to the island an hour after the eruption. They're in two separate helicopters. They see a group of bodies near the crater, so they decide to land close by. They strap on gas masks and run a few hundred yards through shin-deep drifts of hot ash to get to the injured. They saw gruesome burns. Victim's skin had been burned black. Anything exposed was burned. Um, some people they found were unresponsive, but most were alive, but dazed and incoherent and asking for water. So Alex Perry from Outside Magazine says, all 20 people that the pilots found were below the rim of the inner crater, forming a loose line along the path. Many of their burns were so severe that later, when the pilots saw pictures of the dead and missing on the news, they didn't recognize them. One adult was so disfigured it was impossible to tell if they were a man or a woman. As the pilots worked, they were able to sort of piece together some of what had happened. So from where they were, the walkers would have seen the initial eruption. Behind a boulder, Story and Law came across a small pile of phones and tablets. 
And video from those phones and tablets would later confirm that several people had stopped to film the steam cloud. Mm -hmm. What none of them could have seen until it crested the lip of the crater and consumed them was the horizontal blast of rock, ash, and acid mist. Many injuries were to the front side of their bodies, suggesting that they were facing it when it hit. Mm -hmm. A police district commander for the Bay of Plenty, the area where Wakatani is, said uh, in this ash was hydrochloride, hydrofluoride, and sulfur dioxide. Mix those with water and you get hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and sulfuric acid. Oh my goodness. You've got superheated gases, you've got the blast, and you've got the acid atmosphere. Just imagine what that does. What a horrible way to go. Along with the burns, the pilots found evidence of the eruption's force. Uh, Law noted uh, numerous shrapnel injuries on his patients, or victims, I guess, that he helped, uh, and signs of internal damage. The pilots also found signs of, as Alex Perry says, courage and sacrifice. A guide's medical kit was sitting among the group, and it was probably carried there by one of the tour group leaders from Wakatani after the blast. Many of the injured were wearing gas masks that looked to have been placed on them after they'd lost consciousness. The footprints described almost unbelievable heroism. On top of the ash, the prints had to have been made after the eruption and seemed to indicate that one of the tour group leaders, Hayden Marshall Inman, had backtracked and tried to lead his group away from the crater and toward the ocean. The position of his body and those who were near him suggested that in the darkness of the ash cloud, they were following the stream downhill. Then Jason Hill gets a call. There's no cell service in the crater, so another helicopter pilot had been circling the island, passing messages between the three men on the ground and emergency services on shore. That pilot tells Jason that help isn't coming. What? There's a fleet of 11 search and rescue helicopters and first responder crews to staff them, sitting on the ground in Wakatani. But the man in charge, Dr. Tony Smith, a man who I hope was fired at least twice and is facing criminal negligence charges, decided not to go to the island because the information he had was that it wasn't safe to fly there. No shit, bro. What in charge in charge how? Like of of the township? Uh, so I think he is the director of St. John's Medical, which is uh the group that develops procedures and guidelines for the ambulance sector in New Zealand. So he's in charge of the council that decides how first responders will be deployed. Also, just to be clear, there are survivors on the island at this point that need to be taken off and and obviously brought to the hospital. That's right. At this point, there are survivors on the island, and he refuses to go there. Wow. So his organization was, quote, unwilling to put rescue crews in danger. Sarah Abo, who interviewed this piece of shit for 60 Minutes Australia, absolutely refuses to let him off the hook. She's amazing. Mm. You should watch this thing. <laughs> she asks, were you expecting untrained pilots to do the rescuing? He says, absolutely not. And then she cuts back with, yeah, but that's effectively what you did, right? Nice. She's great. So Hill, Story, and Law decide that if they're it, they're it. And they're going to get these people off the island one way or another. So Hill carried Stephanie and her sister Crystal to the helicopter, told them they would be okay, and took off. Now, he's, he's flying the helicopter. But he's also talking to them and trying to keep them conscious the whole way back. Jesus Christ. Yeah. like Yeah. So Stephanie says she was in such bad shape that if he hadn't talked to her and made her respond, that she probably would have lost consciousness and maybe died. I mean, I'm not a helicopter pilot, but if I were, do you know what would probably be hard <laughs> is to try and care for fatally, potentially close to fatally injured people and trying to like fly a helicopter at the same time. Yeah. Well, and this is why these guys are so amazing. Like, they're not trained first responders. They only had first aid kits on the helicopters, which, it, like, the injuries they were seeing so far went beyond their capability to yeah. do anything meaningful about it, yeah. right? But they went anyway. So two hours after the eruption, Hill lands at Wakatani Hospital with Stephanie and Crystal. Um, no Im official emergency response team has yet been dispatched. This is two hours after the eruption. So Stephanie Browett and John Kozad were put into medically induced comas. Stephanie found out later that her sister Crystal had died from her injuries, uh, but she found that out after she was brought out of her coma. Uh, and John wasn't aware that five days after the eruption, his son Chris had died. So when he comes out of his coma, he learns that he missed his son's funeral. Mm. Four weeks after the eruption, Paul Browett, 
Stephanie and Crystal's father dies of his injuries. Stephanie Browett has had eight fingers amputated and more than 20 operations. The survivors required so many skin grafts that New Zealand put out a global order for 33.8 square meters of skin. The equivalent of 16 bodies. Oh, God. So finally, more than two and a half hours after the eruption, a helicopter and rescue team that included Dr. Tony Smith landed on the island. And at that point, all of the survivors had already been evacuated. Mm -hmm. So in this interview in 60 Minutes Australia, Dr. Smith says he knows for sure, for sure, without question, no doubt. Now, first of all, does that sound like someone in the sciences to you? For sure, <laughs> no. for sure, without question? <laughs> yeah, okay. So he says he knows for sure, for sure, that even if his team of first responders had gotten there earlier, they would not have been able to save any additional lives. You can't know that. Yeah, as my mother would say, what a crock of shit. Because not two sentences later in the same interview, he says, when he was asked about what might have happened to Stephanie Browett, had she been picked up earlier? Oh, he, like he turns into a scientist again. He's like, oh, it's impossible to know what would have happened. And he can't possibly speculate. So he's <laughs> fully certain he couldn't have saved anyone, but he can't possibly speculate. There are too many factors for him to speculate about what might have happened if she had. I hate this dude. <laughs> so yeah. after hearing from that fucking guy, it's time to look at some cultural influences here. When they were asked why they'd stopped rescue crews from flying to White Island immediately after the 211 eruption, a spokesperson for the National Air Desk declined to comment. When they were asked why emergency crews were kept away, a spokesperson for the police, which had overall command of the operation, replied with a written statement saying, there were no signs of life, conditions on the island were unstable, and there was significant risk in landing. The difficult decision was made to pull back any deployed aircraft making rescue attempts to prevent further loss of life. Now, to me, this is like, you're a first responder. Your job is to go into the burning building. Yep, yep. And so I look at this and I'm like, the people who become first responders are the kind of people who are willing to go into yeah. the burning building. And so I don't think in any way it's the choice of the first responders to sit there on the ground while civilians who have access to helicopters are saving people or trying to save them. Well, and we're not even asking the first responders. That's right. The people making the decisions are like fucking corporate suits, you know? That's right. So this is um, also from Alex Perry. Um, so that statement, that there are no signs of life and conditions were unstable and there's too much risk, avoids addressing the absence of rescuers in the critical period after the eruption. And it seems intended to obscure the central issue, which is like they played it by a book that was written to, in theory, help people or keep people safe. But in playing by that book, they like ruined their opportunity to get there fast enough to save more lives. Mm -hmm. Five pilots and three helicopters picked up 12 casualties in 40 minutes. The reality of the situation that day, says Mark Law, is that it was all about volunteers taking care of the needs of many while emergency services reacted to the needs of compliance and personal safety. Yep. So from an American perspective, OSHA basically came in and said, it's too dangerous for the first responders. That's I it. mean, were they ultimately worried about liability issues? Is that the... I, you know. I can't, you know, sure. I have uh, to imagine the driving factor would be finance. Of course, because it's reliably <laughs> true, right? So I know, I read rather that um, New Zealand actually didn't allow personal injury lawsuits mm. uh, until like 1974. And then when they allowed them, they did so under the auspices of a new governmental organization that was responsible for looking at everything that happens and saying, okay, well, yes, these people get payouts and these people don't. So it moved from a personal to a governmental decision, basically. Okay. But it's why adventure tourism is such big business in New Zealand, because the people who run the tour companies can't be sued if people get hurt, mm -hmm. right? The government might pay out if you are injured in some way, but the tour company operators aren't liable. I thought I knew what I thought about it, but then as I was reading the rest of this, I, I became confused, which is great. I'm sort of reconsidering preconceived notions here. So the reason I don't know what I think is because the elders of the Gate Awa, um, which is the uh, largest Maori tribe in the area, they're the owners of White Island Tours, and they took the lead in the disaster's aftermath. According to Peruto Garopo, uh, who is from the largest Maori tribe in the area, uh, Wakari, the volcano, is actually a living ancestor to them and is a spiritual being as well as a physical one. Mm. So this tribe bought the White Island Tours operation in 2017 
uh, using money from a state program that was designed to compensate for colonial theft of their land. Um, there were a few racists in town that had a problem with it. The town Wakatani is f like 44% Maori. Mm -hmm. And so most people in town were like, it's not only unpleasant and gross to be racist, it's very impractical. Mm -hmm. Like it gets in the way of getting things done. Right. right? So uh, the tribe used White Island Tours profits to fund social programs for mm -hmm. the Maori. Um, and, you know, it was lovely. Preempting WorkSafe, which is the New Zealand governmental organization that had prohibited rescuers from going to see to the wounded, within hours after the, the disaster, the Gatiawa placed a prohibition on White Island forbidding visits and fishing trips. Mm -hmm. uh, they welcomed and comforted the bereaved. They found them accommodation and food. They led a daily service of communion and remembrance at the Maori Meeting House next to White Island Tours. And four days after the catastrophe, they sailed at dawn to the island with relatives and held another service at sea. Mm -hmm. um, the idea, said one of the elders, Joe Harawira, was to wrap around those grieving mm -hmm. with spiritual understanding. So again, this is this idea of tikanga, right? You don't wait for instruction, but you know what the right thing is as a community, and you do that thing. Yeah. He says that it's the same with Wakatani's pilots. Those chopper pilots, what they did... What we did as a community, it came down to the difference between law and lore, he said. Laws dictate to the pilots that it's too dangerous to go out there, that you are not permitted to go. We are still assessing the situation. But the pilots followed the lore, the heart. There were people out there. They were in danger. They didn't know the situation, and they just went. Mm. Taking risk could cost lives, no doubt, said Harawira. But the authorities had forgotten that it could save them, too. Mm -hmm. that's beautiful yeah so now it's two and a bit years later the browitz and other survivors are suing the billion dollar cruise company royal caribbean their lawyer says it's a it's staggering the amount of evidence of danger that was passed over and ignored two weeks before the eruption the volcano's risk warning was upgraded to level two but neither the cruise ship nor the tour company told tourists until they were on the island mm -hmm. Now, as we've seen, it's not possible to predict this particular volcano with the same level of accuracy as others. So when I first read that, I was, I was like, oh, clearly these people are negligent. But the last time this volcano erupted was in 2016. And at that point, it was only at a level one risk warning. Right. So does so, it really matter? Yeah. Like it hiss, you know, and as of November 29th, 2020, work safe has charged 13 parties, 10 organizations, and three people over the deaths on the island that day, saying that the people who visited the island had a reasonable expectation that safety systems were in place. They are not investigating or commenting on the rescue side of the operation. Mm -hmm. They are only looking at what allowed those people to be on the island at a dangerous time like that. Mm -hmm. And no tours to Wakari are currently permitted. And that is the as yet unfinished story uh, of the tragedy on Wakar Island. Yeah. Wow. Gross. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, uh, you know, after Citizens United, right? So uh, dollars are votes now. Dollars are speech in America. And there's this idea that, you know, if we're willing to forego, like if we're willing to allow someone else to decide whether it's safe for us to do something, which, again, no judgment for the most part. And in most cases, I am. Like, I believe experts, right? But there's this thing about, do you know that experts are the ones making the call? Or is it like like it was on the Costa Concordia? Is it like members of the Porter staff who are saving people? Because the captain is shit-faced and out in a lifeboat already, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of that there. But also this idea that when I was first researching this, it really looked to me like the people who had gone out to rescue people were in danger of being charged with something. And that made me so angry. And I, I looked and looked and, you know, I, I'd have to know more about New Zealand government to know whether that's true. Like the articles I'm reading seem to take for granted a level of knowledge I don't have. Yeah. And so, but I know Mark Law has said that he, I think he was actually charged with something. Now he might've been charged not in this this workplace series of indictments or, or charges, but his employer might've done something or some local authority might've done something. I'm not sure. But the idea that the people who had done the work of saving human lives are now facing charges 
because they refuse to stop saving people's lives makes me <laughs> That's sick bad shit. Stomach. Yeah. Yeah, it's bad shit. Yeah. Oh lord. Yeah. So yeah, that was a little bit of a downer. Well, thanks for the story. That was harrowing. Yeah, you're welcome. And fuck Royal Caribbean. There you go. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. If you have any comments, questions, concerns. <laughs> if you want to see a picture of Claire's hair. <laughs> please contact us at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com. We will be back later this week with our smidgen edition. A little short taste for your end of the week. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Testing. Great. Thank you for listening to It Chooses You. Your hosts are Teresa Sparks and Claire Patton. Our theme song is by Bobby Dart. If you'd like to get in touch with us, drop us an email at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com. <laughs>